Um, I wanted to just take a second, since I have the stage, <laughs> to uh, respond to um, Lisa's question. Um, but I don't think she's back yet. But um, regarding, you know, what what can movements do in situations where they literally don't have access to any type of media um, at all and where it's extremely high risk. And I th what, I, what I would say um, is that I think this is the situation where advocates, um, you know, folks working outside in the diaspora really come in and, and play a key role because it's going to be much lower risk for those folks to tell the story on behalf of their colleagues, you know, and back at home. Um, so I, I really think um, there are, there are ways to begin to address this, although um, it is it is it is a hindrance. Um, so before I start my formal presentation, I just want to just give you a little bit of feedback, which is that this is my fourth FSI and. Um, and this is by far um, my favorite one so far, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> um, but the primary reason for that is because of all of you. I haven't had a chance to sit down and talk with everybody here. Hopefully, I'll be able to do that before I leave tomorrow afternoon. But if not, I'm very accessible online. Just Google my name, and, um, and you'll find me. Um, but I really think that you should be commended. You should commend yourselves for the, um, the degree to which you've embraced this experience at FSI. It's, it's impressive. OK, and then I want to say one other thing as sort of an aside. Um, and it, it came up for me as I was listening to some of the other earlier presentations and um, some of the side discussions that we've been having over the course of the week. Um, a few weeks ago, I participated in an educational program at San Quentin Prison, which is, I guess most of you know, is um, one of the most notorious prisons um, in the United States. Um, almost everyone housed in San Quentin now has um, committed at least one murder. Um, and uh, the, the, the program that I participated in was for a group of, of lifers who self-selected into this opportunity to um, become more educated on uh, various um, disciplines. So I went to, to give them a talk um, along the lines of Jack's introductory um, module on the first day of FSI, of course much less eloquent, but the, the content was essentially the same. And um, and I, what I wanted to say about it is, is that they, this group of inmates, all of whom had been in prison for at least 15 years, um, one whom had been there for 38 years, since he was 17 years old, they embraced this subject matter more forcefully and, and with more enthusiasm than almost any other single group of, of students um, and people to which I have introduced um, the subject. And, and that includes peace activists, members of social justice movements, in, including in the United States, um, students in graduate programs studying human rights, um, and so on. And I was trying to think about wh why would that be? You know, this, this group of people that, that has um, very little chance of, of ever actually leaving the walls of, of this, um, this prison. And I think it's because Nonviolent action offers something humanizing and empowering and, um, and it makes us, it connects us to one another in a very um, obvious and um, direct way. And I think that that really resonated with them. And so for me that re reinforced the view that nonviolent action really is about embracing life which is a theme that's come up repeatedly in a lot of these modules throughout the course of the week. So um, I wanted to start with that. So, okay. Um, so our modules at the end of the day, towards the end of the week, and following on Al and <laughs> Craig, so no pressure, um, 
it's, it's tough to follow Al because he makes a very good case for the uselessness of mainstream or conventional media. And the, the subject that I'm looking at today is mainstream and conventional media. Um, but what I would say in, in response to his remarks, which I, I largely agree with, is that the reality is that, um, for the moment at least, we do still have to deal with conventional media. Um, and for some folks, that's the only media to which they have access. So given that, I think that it's prudent to understand how distortions in media coverage of the phenomenon that we've been discussing this week help shape global perceptions of the efficacy of nonviolent action. And um, I think that looking at how um, conventional media covers nonviolent struggles and civil resistance can tell us something about um, the tools that are used to frame stories and how we can then recognize and then address um, some of those tools or um, what I'll call techniques or biases. So um, what I would say is that, is that Alan Gregg kind of gave, gave you the what regarding traditional media and then um, how to, how to respond to that. And, and I'm going to focus more on the how um, traditional media deals with um, struggles. So I have a general interest in this subject as a scholar and an activist and a media contributor, but I, I briefly want to tell you the story of how I became interested in this particular area of study. Um, and it, it, it grew out of exactly the phenomenon that Al described about that um, that surreal moment when you recognize that your experience with reality is very different than the experience um, that is being described by others, um, sometimes many others. So back in the early fall of 2007, I was teaching a course at um, State University of New York on uh, civil resistance and on violent action. And I had a student in that class um, who, it turned out, completely coincidentally, was um, one of Tim's peers, actually, from the 1988 uprising in Burma. And um, he had he'd spent seven years in prison um, and then a couple of years um, in the armed resistance in Thailand and eventually made his way to the United States where he wanted to study nonviolent action. And that's how he ended up in my class. Um, and so when I learned this, of course, um, I, I realized I've got to, I've got to work with this person. This is, this is an incredible opportunity. It also turned out that a couple of weeks later, the, the Saffron Revolution, um, the, or the, the beginning of the Saffron Revolution, um, began to um, make the news. So, um, so this, this young man, the student Mo, um, was working full-time as an activist from the diaspora for the Burmese movement, in addition to being a full-time student and running a full-time business, which I'm, I'm guessing is not an unusual um, experience, um, very humbling. Um, and so what he would do is he would get, he would get information um, from his colleagues inside the country about actions and tactics that were going on and, and, and this was all being delivered in Burmese. And then he would translate it. He would stay up sometimes all night translating this news from inside the country and then give it to me in English. And then I would write an article about it. Um, um, and, and so I had a series of, of pieces published over the course of about eight or 10 weeks in the fall of 2007 as the Saffron Revolution was um, hitting its stride. And um, it was during this experience that I began to really understand this phenomenon about how um, media <coughs> unintentionally, um, or let me, excuse me, intentionally or usually unintentionally um, gets the story either wrong or incomplete um, or um, out of context in some way. So, so as each day passed, the gap between what I was hearing about what was actually going on 
in Mandalay and Rangoon, and then what was being reported in in um, in mainstream. Um, and I'm thinking mostly here about um, television, cable news networks. The gap continued to grow, so that it became very surreal. Um, and then I get the the, the final um, push for me here was when. Uh, Mo and I got a local NBC affiliate to come interview him and me about the Saffron Revolution and what was happening in Burma. And I spent about an hour with this particular reporter. Mo spent an hour with him. Um, and this, this was on camera. I also spent a couple of hours talking to the reporter before and after the interview, trying to contextualize the phenomenon and um, really emphasize the significance of what was going on here. And I felt really good about it. I felt like after, after the interview, you know, this was going to be this amazing story. This, this NBC affiliate in Rochester, New York, was going to cover this incredible story about civil resistance. And they were going to get it right, how the dynamic works and why this was significant, and especially the fact that people were continuing to resist despite the repression. And, and then what happened was um, later that night, the story ran on the NBC um, channel on their, on their new show, and it was about five minutes long, and it had nothing to do with what we had spent all day discussing <laughs> with the reporter. There was a, a short feature on me as a teacher, and they showed a snippet of me talking to a group of students um, about something that had nothing to do with the subject at hand, um, and then they, they showed some some clips of some of the most extreme violence that had gone on um, in, in Burma. And then they went to, um, to Mo, and they, they showed him being interviewed, but they didn't actually play the audio of him speaking. Instead, there was a voiceover, a narrative, about how he had been victimized. He had spent seven years in prison. He had been tortured. But the whole, the whole frame on the story was this, this person is a victim of this brutal regime. And that's the story. And then there were, there were some pictures of monks being beaten. And, and so um, I was, I, of course, I was upset by this. I was angry. But even more so, I was, I was demoralized. And um, I guess this will demonstrate to you how, how naive I actually am. I was shocked. I was shocked at, at, um, at how wrong this, this story was told. So. So that was really my motivation for, um, this, for looking into this phenomenon, specifically um, how and why um, conventional media coverage of this, this phenomenon of, of strategic nonviolent action um, is so misunderstood or so distorted. So um, I don't need to tell you that this is a historical time. Um, and that we have a moment right now to really shape the narrative. You as, as activists, as journalists, as um, advocates have the opportunity um, to really define these struggles. And so th this is a moment where we can really impact the global understanding of this phenomenon. And so if careless or uninformed interpretations become the dominant narratives, then I would argue it could seriously undermine the power of the phenomenon itself and arguably have a negative impact on the capacity of movements to be effective. So this, this I think, is why um, this is especially um, important for me personally, because beyond being an issue of media responsibility, which I, I think it is, um, telling stories of civil resistance accurately is also a matter of personal integrity. So um, I think that most of you will recognize this photograph from the fall of 2007 um, from um, Burma's Saffron Revolution. And I, I want to ask you to just reflect for a second on what you see when you glance at this photograph. Now, unfortunately, everybody in this room is likely to interpret this or, or frame this image in a slightly different way than your average um, 
media consumer, but um, hopefully the, the point is still um, conveyed. So, so when, you see, when you see a photograph like this, do you see victims or do you see empowered action takers or who is confronting whom in this picture? What assumptions do you make about, is this a hopeful image or is this a demoralizing image? You know, is, is this an image of success or failure? And do you see the violence in the picture or do you see nonviolence in the picture? So these are rhetorical questions. I don't want everybody to answer them right now, but I do want you to think about how do you, how do you respond when you see an image like this? And most of us, by the time we're shown a photograph like this, we've already decided what we're going to conclude about what's going on in the image, regardless of the reality behind the story. And this is because we've been subjected over time to a saturation of subconscious messages or frames about how to understand and interpret a phenomenon like <coughs> civil resistance. And these frames over time have helped to harden our beliefs in such a way that it's actually in many cases easier to force reality to conform to our assumptions and our predetermined conclusions than it is to shift our perspectives based on reality. And this, um, to some degree, is what I think happened with the NBC reporter that I, that I worked with um, on the story about Burma. It also explains why, for example, conventional wisdom can't make sense of ongoing resistance in places like Iran, Burma, Bahrain, and elsewhere other than to assign credit to external forces, like the United States, um, or to explain those phenomena, phenomena away as um, insignificant or less significant um, than they actually are. So um, given that, hardened and um, often erroneous beliefs about phenomena like power and violence are undoubtedly the genesis of more than a few conspiracy theories. Um, and I would also argue that media frames can reinforce key distortions um, in knowledge about struggles to such a degree that they can unwittingly default to the perspective of the oppressor, undermining the movement or campaign, um, unwittingly enabling brutality to be ongoing, um, and, and even in some cases, um, force the movement or force activists um, into a perspective where they, they perceive that nonviolent action is, is, is failing and therefore violence may be the only um, alternative remaining. So a media or conceptual frame forms the cognitive structure around what we perceive as reality. And it, regarding media, it determines which part of the news story we find most signif significant, and it helps us to draw subconscious but often deeply embedded conclusions about the meaning in a story. Um, the theory of framing also asserts that media can exert influence on audience perception of an event through the careful selection of words and images. So you can think of frames as organizing principles, um, metaphors, in, in news stories that help audiences comprehend information in, in um, particular ways. So how do they, they work? Well, go back in time to the summer of 2009, two years ago, and think about what happens when an Iranian democracy activist sees a CNN streaming headline that refers to Ahmadinejad as victorious in the Iranian elections, or that refers to Mousavi as the defeated challenger at the height of the resistance against what is still largely considered to be a stolen election. They're likely to consider, uh, I'm sorry, to conclude that 
that the regime's attempt at what is um, widely understood to be a coup has succeeded. And then this in turn could dampen enthusiasm and morale, which could cause some in the movement to go home. Or worst case scenario, could cause others to turn to violent means, a last um, desperate resort to fight back. Now, um, I would argue that most of the time, um, media frames are not consciously manufactured. They, they are um, sor sort of unconscious um, defaults. Occasionally, media frames are consciously manufactured. Just turn on Fox News and you will see examples of that. But I think the major culprit is the inability or unwillingness of reporters to engage in serious investigative and um, assiduous on the ground reporting. This is what um, to some degree Al was talking about. And so this can be extraordinarily frustrating, as you know, for members of a nonviolent democracy struggle who, in addition to everything else, find themselves in the midst of an uprising having to unspin erroneous media coverage coming from all directions. So in order to get a handle on um, how it is that some of these um, erroneous or incomplete conclusions emerge, I've, I've identified um, five of the most common techniques or biases that um, help shape public perceptions of civil resistance. And my hope is that the more conscious we are of these techniques as activists, advocates, scholars, and journalists, the less efficacy they'll have. So I'm just going to go through these really quickly. Um, the first technique is, is fragmentation or the fragmentation bias. And so this is where you see a story covered um, in, in individual, isolated, and, and often unrelated or seemingly unrelated pieces. So um, a horribly fragmented story will be totally removed from its historical or political context. Um, fragmentation is something, it doesn't, it can't just happen in one moment in time, it's ongoing, but you can recognize it over the course of a struggle. Um, these are, um, th these are examples of headlines th that, let's see, um, they all come from 2009 uprising in Iran that um, are examples of fragmentation. They're examples of other things as well, but, um, the one that I want to draw your attention to is the use of the term crowds, which in, in the first headline, crowds join Ahmadinejad's victory rally. Crowd, the term crowds was used to describe a lot of things that were going on in Tehran in um, that summer. And um, the term crowds, it, it, it implies kind of an ad hoc gathering of a bunch of people together for no specific purpose. So if it's used repeatedly, with reference to um, an ongoing struggle, it can, it can begin to create the perception that, that what's going on isn't systematic or is not intentional. Um, another example of a, of a framing technique is dramatization. This you will all recognize. This is when the story is um, highly sensationalized. The idea behind dramatization is to provoke an emotional response, preferably shock. Um, secondarily, fear or anxiety. Um, dramatization thrives on confusing the audience and leading them to skeptical or um, demoralizing conclusions. And there's, there's often a lot of unconscious emphasis on the visual drama in the story. So this is where you get a lot of emphasis on the violence. The lens is focused on the violence in, in the dynamic as opposed to the resistance to the violence or what provoked the crackdown in the first place. Um, so these are examples of, again, dramatization um, in um, headlines. From Two of them are from um, the fall of 07, and then the third from 2009. I've got to, I'm sorry, I've got to move through these kind of quickly, because Howard just told me I had five minutes left five minutes ago. Um, <laughs> The third, the third um, bias I want to mention is euphemism. Um, again, you'll recognize this. This is where language is selected specifically to shift the emphasis, um, sometimes 
to fundamentally alter the meaning of the word. Um, so occasionally the, the, the meaning of the term can actually be turned upside down. And a common example is um, a phrase like restoring normalcy or restoring order or restoring stability um, with reference to a crackdown by a regime. Um, but these are some other examples of euphemism um, from recent struggles. So in the first one, One Month on Burmese Regime, Stages Show of Strength, this was a story about repression on, against monks. But, um, and, and, and it's interesting because we had a co brief conversation this morning in the car on the way over here about how The Guardian was, is one of the best um, media venues in terms of comprehensively covering civil resistance. And, but, but yet, um, they are guilty of this, um, like everyone else, of conflating strength with um, violence or strength with, with repression or desperation. Um, and then these are some other examples. Um, another technique that you will be familiar with is um, saturation, sa excuse me, saturation. And so this is where the, the, the same terms, um, images, and memes are um, repeated constantly. They're everywhere, um, and, and they're consistent across various media. And so um, if, you've, if you have ever studied the work of someone like George Lakoff or Stephen Reese, others who have worked in, um, in, in the area of framing, um, you'll know that saturation can be an incredibly powerful way of getting people to believe things that they then cannot go on to articulate or defend um, why. And then the last bias I want to mention is, is called the authority bias. And, and this is where when, um, when, when information is sparse or of questionable, questionable veracity or when um, there's just not enough time, when, when time is of the essence, um, often media will, will default to the perspective of the officials, the authorities. Um, a, a very surreal example of this was, again, to use the Iran Iranian example from 2009, for, for many days at the beginning of the um, Green Uprising um, in June of that, that year, um, entities like CNN and even BBC and others were going to the um, Iranian Information Ministry for perspective and interpretation of the events on the ground. But of course, this institution's job is to create propaganda. Um, so um, the other piece of the authority bias is that, is that government or the, the authority or officials in power, who often are the source of the chaos being addressed, are expected to provide a response to the crisis. And so here are a couple of um, brief examples of the authority bias in action. So um, I think the first one especially is, is interesting because um, the point here, and again, look at this as BBC, but, but, but the way to interpret this, I think, is to say that the regime is investigating itself. Great, right? Um, there are a number of other culprits in, in um, media distortions. These are a few. Um, I would argue that um, the, f the first two are probably the most significant. Um, and then, the, just because I have to wrap this up, the, the last piece of, of what I want to mention is something that I'm calling metaframes, which are these more deeply held um, long-term and hardened beliefs about concepts with which we're all familiar that then go on to inform how we interpret the, this more surface level or story level frames. And so these are, are some of the most common meta frames that drive how we tend to interpret stories about civil resistance. The idea that power is top down, the idea that power is monolithic, the idea that conflict is inherently undesirable, um, the idea that violence is more effective um, than <coughs> nonviolent action as a means of waging struggle. And um, especially the idea that, that when telling a story, 
emphasizing the repression or the violence is more interesting than emphasizing the resistance to that repression. Um, so kind of the opposite of everything we're talking about here. This <laughs> right, this exactly. Kind of saying, exactly. That's right? exactly right. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, so I'm not going to go through these now, but if we want to do this in Q&A or tonight in the open discussion, we can talk about these. I'm, I'm, I'm working on an article about this specific subject now, but, but there, these are five of um, the most prominent examples of, of distortions that emerged in framing about the Egyptian uprising. Um, that it was spontaneous, that it was um, not secular, um, or that, that the objectives of the struggle um, were religious in nature, that it was actually a military coup, that it was actually orchestrated, commandeered by the United States, and that it, actually, that it, it was really not nonviolent. Um, so tonight, if we have time, we can sort of talk through um, some of the ways in which this was framed and um, why these are. Um, distortions. Um, and I think Al and, and Greg and, and also Howard um, will do a, a, a comprehensive job of, of beginning to address how you can start to um, fix some of these distortions and start to address them your, yourselves. So um, here are my contributions to that discussion. And I love that. Um, that cartoon, Stop or I'll Tweet, that's from, <laughs> from Iran um, in 2009. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Howard because we're running out of time. Thank you. Here we are. My, the title of my thing is Horse Racing with an Elephant in the Room. There was supposed to be something going, bah, okay? <laughs> and uh, this is the, the elephant's problem, is that nobody is paying him any attention. Now, the elephant in the room is something that was alluded to by Nicole a moment ago, is that we don't really know what effect the me media coverage has on us. I mean, there's some good thinking going, and there's some good work that's been done recently, which you alluded to, and there's other work by people in involved in political consultancy, etc., and psychology. Interesting work on the effect of media coverage. But we know surprisingly little about it. And that is the elephant in the room. Those of you who are not native English speakers, I should just tell you that the term elephant in the room refers to something big in a meeting or something which everybody's kind of tiptoeing around, too scared to face up to and deal with. Okay? And in talking about the media, whether we're in media studies or in journalism or sociology or wherever, the big elephant in the room is that we know remarkably little about media effects. Okay? And what there are is some very good work that's being done. And then there are a lot of guesses, assumptions, and theories about whether people are influenced in media, and if yes, how. But these are, by and large, assumptions. And the general assumption is that, yes, our consciousness or our way of behaving uh, is significantly shaped by the media. Now, in this presentation, I'm going to be dealing with media effects, and I'm going to say a little bit, I'm going to do two, three things. I'm going to say a little bit about this elephant in the room, uh, who's number one. Number two, which is now also number one, should read that what I'm also going to do is I'm going to talk about the way in which two groups of journalists, one in South Africa and one in Burma, have set about, notwithstanding the confusion about what media effects actually are, to try to use media to achieve particular effects, and I'm going to try to throw a little bit of light on the strategies that they've used. And I'm doing this, and it's important to bear this in mind, this is a theme that's come up again and again and again. I'm doing this, I'm looking at these two examples, not to suggest to you that there's one single method, or two methods, or only two methods, uh, that are, uh, are available to us or that are universally applicable. That's not what I'm on about. Instead, what I'm trying to do is to show how each of these groups, in the circumstances in which they found themselves, concluded that they could most effectively engage with their circumstances in order to change their circumstances. Okay? It's what Peter was talking about earlier today. We hear about changing things. We not hear about to say, oh, you know, circumstance have got the better of me and 
it's all over Skadovas. And so what I'm talking about is the way in which people reasoned themselves to a particular strategy. They took a guess, they took a punt, okay? They took a conjecture, they said, okay, we don't know, but let's try something. And I'm going to look at the two things that these people tried. But let's just go to the elephant psychotherapy that we visited a moment ago. The elephant has a problem, and I just want to re-go over again the, 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 the way in which this problem uh, presents itself. The elephant believes on the one hand that media affects our attitudes and behavior, but he can't demonstrate it. People seek from uh, uh, media information to help them make rational decisions, many of us believe. But we also uh, believe, and it has seemed, seemed to have been quite conclusively shown in some work, that the media most effectively appeals to us through emotion, through appeals to our identity or our values. Some of us maintain that the detail in media stories and their framing construct how we respond to events, but there are others who say that media only affects what we think about rather than in framing our opinions on what we think about what we think about, and so on. There's nothing wrong with this debate and this uncertainty. We deal with uncertainty every morning. In fact, we don't know whether the sun is actually going to come up tomorrow. It's an expectation of psychology. It's not a fact of logic. We live with uncertainty. But these inconsistencies are sharp, and the elephant suffers, we suffer on this matter from an acute case of cognitive dissonance. But life must go on. There are things to be done, struggles to be won, and we've got to muddle through our, our uncertainties. We've got to take calculated risks on what the media might be able to achieve in our circumstances. And I'm going to move now to the first of our examples, South Africa. And in doing so, I want to say that I share none of the hopelessness about the media. There is good journalism, there is bad journalism. There are good media, there are bad media. There are media I agree with, there are media I disagree with. I do not fear or feel any despondency about the media as such or in general. Let us go back to South Africa, 1977. And this is about a group of journalists of which I was part. The basic situation at that point was that here was a population, a country with a population of about 26 million people at that point. Politically and economically, the domination of whites was pretty well absolute. Whites constituted only 9% of the population but held all the power. The black African majority numbered 79%, four out of five people, uh, and were dispossessed of their political and economic power, their traditions, their military traditions, etc. There were about 9 million colored or so-called mixed race people, and there were about 3% South Africans of Indian origin, that is people who'd been brought out as indentured laborers and slaves uh, in the uh, um, 19th and, at least the, the, yeah, in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Now, there had been, in 1977, the Soweto uprising a year earlier, in which hundreds of young unarmed black children had been shot dead by police. Severe oppression had been unleashed. The country was in a state of convulsion and ongoing uprisings. There had also emerged, several years earlier, a group called the Black Consciousness Movement. They had brought about a substantial reappraisal by black people of their own worth and, and a, a huge kind of emotional renaissance uh, and a sense of historical arrival or re-arrival by black South Africans. And resistance was continuing. And there were scores of small and medium-sized organizations being formed and struggles being fought around rents and this and that and boycotts. And the f this was really the first resistance that, that had emerged inside South Africa since the ANC had been, unban had been banned, rather, about 17 years earlier in 1960. As I've said earlier, nonviolent resistance had been led by the ANC from 1912, but in 1960 it had turned to armed struggle and had been uh, crushed. Now, in these circumstances in 1977, there was a group of us, black and white, mainly black, a couple of whites, who found ourselves working together on what was a black audience newspaper. South Africa in this, this time of extreme segregation had newspapers, all of which were owned by whites or white companies, but some of which were 
directed in audience terms towards black readers and some towards whites. And this was a black audience newspaper owned by a big company called the Argus Company. There were two editions. There was the, the, week, the daily edition called Post and the Sunday edition called Sunday Post. The editor was a noble but sedentary and bibulous man called Percy Koboza, who had more knowledge of single malt whiskey than any man I've ever met. <laughs> and Percy's, uh, let us say, talent for self-sedation meant that we young people on the newspaper actually ran it. Some of us were members of the ANC underground. I wasn't at that point. But those of us who weren't wanted to do what we inferred the ANC's bidding might be. And the question that we faced as young people was, how do we use our position as journalists to take the struggle forward now? We had endless discussion and debate. We faced huge problems of censorship among them, that you couldn't say anything that might be construed as furthering the aims of the ANC and several other organizations. You couldn't quote many people who were politically involved because they were, as it was termed, banned or house arrested. Um, there were hundreds of laws, literally, which applied to what you could and could not publish. And there was always the threat of administrative action against you. You could be detained without trial or banned or worse. Now, our first response to what should we be doing was, well, let's, you know, the people are suffering. Let's report on the suffering of the people. Well, yes, you know, I mean, the people are suffering, sure, but we weren't satisfied with that answer. One member of our group had actually taught journalism at uh, uh, the first university-based journalism uh, course in South Africa at a university called Rhodes University. And he'd come across a theory of journalism called, which some people now call the agenda theory of journalism. And basically what this argued, has anybody got a newspaper here? That I, could, I could have a look at. Anybody got a newspaper? Yes, thank, thank you. Thanks, Mary. The agenda uh, theory of, thank you, of uh, journalism basically argues that in any news cycle, a daily news cycle or a weekly news cycle, if it's a, new, a weekly newspaper or a weekly program on television, in, in any news cycle, any reasonably serious um, news organization implicitly sets an agenda in an order of importance of the issues confronting a society. And the way in which it does so is by reporting news events through which these issues obtrude. Okay? And it orders the importance of these issues or these events by a number of devices. And I'll just show you the devices on newspapers are perhaps easiest to follow. Obviously, that becomes well, one of these. It's, the New York Times is a strange newspaper if you come from where I come from. Look, I know it's very good, but... The most important is on the upper right. Upper right, okay. Upper right. I'll take Mary's reference. <laughs> You're supposed to read in a six, so it's upper right. Absolutely, yes. Upper right, that's the most important story stroke issue. To, this is called the fold, okay? So the most important stories will be above the fold. And the front page, of course, is the page, le page. Eh? The second le page is usually three, but I see they've let in some adverts here, which is a real sellout if you're a journalist. But anyway, but one, three, and five, okay, are really the, the key pages in a newspaper, usually, traditionally. And above the fold is very important. Below the fold comes the kind of less important stuff, usually a light story. So come and meet the author and prepare to open your wallet. If you want to go in, into a bookshop now, you've got to pay for it to meet some author or something like that. Okay? So you get the idea of ordering of an agenda of issues. And this chap who brought this idea to us, his name was Graham. He went on to an illustrious career at Financial Times. He said, now come on guys, if this is true, if an agenda of issues is being implicitly set, in our society, every time we, or in our newspaper, every time we come out, daily or weekly, why don't we do it consciously? Why don't we sit down and analyze the problems in our society and decide what we think on the basis of our analysis is the most important issue? So we started off where we left off, which was with suffering. <laughs> and we thought, yeah, well, people are suffering, but it didn't take us anywhere. 
People were suffering. People were really suffering. And then Graham, the same person, came up and said, in a, I think in one of our more, um, let's say, substance-enhanced meetings, he said, actually, you know, the issue, the issue is resistance. You could hear the penny dropped, okay? Resistance, he had it spot on. What we wanted to prioritize on our agenda of news was resistance, 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 followed by resistance and resistance, okay? <laughs> suffering was good, you know, so when I say good, I mean suffering was okay as an idea to, to, to promote, but... It didn't take us anywhere. Resistance was the issue, okay, that we had to get across. If we were going to explicitly set an agenda, our agenda had to be resistance. Now, important point. We didn't have to say the great and glorious people's army in Kunta, we sees we yesterday attacked the racist regime, blah, blah, blah. We didn't have to go in for language like that. We could retain modest, clear, simple, dispassionate language but all we would do is in terms of setting the agenda, in terms of a, which page we were putting stories on, and whether they were above or below the fold, resistance. Above the fold, page one, resistance. Above the fold, page three, okay, above the fold, so on. Okay? Now, I've done a little diagram here, which took me ages, because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit challenged in these matters. But if that's page one on the left there, you'll see resistance above the fold in big black type, resistance below the fold, and then space for something else at the bottom. Page two, resistance above the fold, other stuff below. Page three, resistance above the fold, resistance below the fold. Okay? Come to the comments page, we had a column called Black Eye, which is a rather sardonic uh, political column, come diary column where we used to comment on politics and anybody we didn't like in a most vicious way. And it was called Black Eye for two reasons. One, because we were a black audience newspaper, so the, whatever we were saying was seen through a black eye. And of course, Black Eye has the notions of actually giving somebody a black eye of a, of a different kind. Okay? So, and then our discussions and our analysis would be on resistance. Okay? Now... We started the Free Mandela campaign in South Africa. This is an old, very old photograph taken from a very good book, in fact, called A Different Kind of War, Jack. Have you ever seen it? I must give you a copy. It's a really important thing. Done by an American called Julie Fredrickson, who was the, the uh, national public radio reporter in South Africa until she was kicked out. And then, in fact, shortly before, uh, one of the last things we did on this newspaper <laughs> was publish a the Freedom Charter, which was a, a uh, very eloquent statement of political and social and economic objectives that had been drawn up by the ANC and its allies in 1955 and which hadn't seen the light of day legally in South Africa at that stage for at least 17 years. Okay? It was one of the last things we ever did and we were allowed to do, but I'll come to that in a moment. And that was probably and possibly a mistake, but we did it. These were two of our more famous moments, but for the most part, what we were writing was about news. We worked on the theory, and other of our conjectures was, our, our guesses was, that news, if we gave news of resistance, that was actually far more powerful than if we had an editorial saying, now is the time for people to stand up for their, their rights or whatever. We wanted examples of things actually happening, okay? Not moralizing or, you know, giving opinion. Now, there was another side to this. You've had the elephant, okay, and the way which, in which we guessed ourselves around the elephant's great posterior, or bottom. The other side of the strategy was horse racing, okay? Now, black people in South Africa are very fond of football, good for them, but they're also, and this is a slightly politically incorrect secret about the revolutionary classes in South Africa, they're also into horse racing in a big way, okay? <laughs> So what we decided, or what our, our sort of leader decided, was that we had to get ourselves the best horse racing tipster in the country. Yeah. 
Now, the best horse racing tipster in the country also happened to be one of the most thoroughly unpleasant, backward, retrograde, reactionary racists around. But we paid him a fortune, whatever it took, and we had him as our racing tipster. Okay? Now, what's the lesson here? What am I saying when I say the lesson? What are we saying here? We're talking about giving people not just what we think they need to have, i.e., this consciously reasoned agenda, but giving people what they want, too. A little bit of fun doesn't do anybody any harm. Eh? You can't be an earnest revolutionary all the time. I mean, try as we might. We couldn't ourselves. Okay? You can't be. You've got to give people what they want, as well as, well, we reasoned, what we thought they need, needed to know about or to be reminded of. Now, what was the media effect? Well, we don't know. But all I can say is that anecdotally, in terms of the stories and the response we got from individual people, they were fantastic. It became, the newspapers became nationwide a must read for anybody involved in the opposition or militant opposition. I once came across a young exile in Lesotho and I went across to meet the ANC for the first time. Lesotho is a little country, landlocked country inside South Africa. And this guy said, uh, you heard I worked for Sunday Post, and he said, Man, it's like Al Sachaba. Now, Sachaba was actually the name of the ANC's uh, official journal. But the, we, as far as he was concerned, we were the internal Sachaba. He got what we were on about. Now, it took the South African government a bit longer to find out what we were on about. But they did, and in the end, they closed us down after the Freedom Charter. We published the Freedom Charter. But by that stage, this approach had, in, was, was in some or other degree, been taken up in many other areas, in particular among uh, the young student press in which Janet Cherry was, was very much involved. I want to move to Burma, and I've got to pick up speed a bit. I want to speak, speak about Burma, and I know there are people here from Burma who are much more knowledgeable than I am, but I'm going to do it nonetheless because we, um, ICNC has sent another chap called Josh Yeager and myself, and we've uh, spoken to quite a few people involved, particularly in Democratic Voice of Burma. And I want to speak about how they are seeing their strategy, because I think they have got a much more sophisticated view than ever we developed in South Africa. Now, just to give you a bit of background, in Burma in 1992, which is the date we must go back to. Since 1962, there had been uh, 14 years of, uh, after getting independence. Burma found, from 1962, Burma found itself under a military dictatorship of some kind or another. The opposition had been making little progress. The dictatorship had crushed the student uprising in 1988. And when it had held, rather surprisingly, free elections in 1990, Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy had won 80% of the seats, but the dictatorship had refused to uh, accept the election outcome or step down from power. And so the dictatorship continued. Those students who had been uh, attacked in 1988 had gone into the bush into the jungles and had joined up in some instances with some of the ethnically based insurgencies there and had themselves, the students, started an insurgency. But by 1992, the uh, military dictatorship had invaded their camps, basically cleared them out, and had rendered uh, the armed struggle, uh, certainly by the students, ineffective. And uh, a number of students began to re-examine fundamentally their approach to uh, strategy and tactics in uh, trying to bring about democracy in Burma. Now, at that time, it's important to recognize that all media was owned by the government, or where it wasn't, it was subject to very strict government control, usually in the form of in-house censorship. Anything had to be approved before it could be published. Now, after the defeat of the insurgency, many students moved in terms of their strategic and tactical thinking towards Aung San Suu Kyi's view that nonviolent forms of struggle were a better way forward. By the way, the good-looking one on the left is Josh Yeager. Okay? <laughs> the other guy you can recognize. Okay? All right. With Aung San Suu Kyi. We interviewed her a couple of months ago. Now, a number of these students who had been in, involved in the armed struggle decided that they had to move across now and start, think, as I say, reassessing. And many, perhaps most, and our Burmese friends here can correct me, I'm wrong, 
began to say, well, we've got a, Aung San Suu Kyi's got a much more realistic and, and, and uh, plausible path than we had before. In 1992, Aung San Suu Kyi was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and she went to Oslo to collect it. And there she met with a number of these students, plus some people involved in the Norwegian Solidarity Movement with Burma. And they decided that what they needed to form was a media organization, an independent, uh, an opposition-controlled media organization, which could give uh, the, uh, a balanced view of what was happening in Burma, or at least a view that would uh, contend against the view being put across by the Burmese government. And they recognized, of course, too, that Burma is fairly marginal in international affairs, hence there was not likely to be a lot of coverage of Burma um, unless uh, uh, something major happened there and there needed to be sustained coverage and for that to happen there needed to be the formation of a opposition Burmese uh, news organization. So they formed the Democratic Voice of Burma, which was initially under the editorial control of the opposition parties, a sort of a joint coalition in, of, of opposition parties around the, the station. That was a particular disadvantage, which I'm going to come to in a moment. But they were also broadcasting, now by radio alone at that point, 5,000 miles across the Arctic Circle into Burma. So the signal was very weak. And uh, the news and information uh, that uh, was being reported by DBB could only be what the opposition agreed to. DVB journalists had no editorial independence. News and information was also second or third hand and usually out of date by the time they got it to broadcast it and the signal couldn't be heard properly. The style of, of broadcasting was also propagandist demagoguery. You know, the vicious dictatorship, this, a lot of adjectives. And feedback from inside the country was unfavorable. Favorable. Many Burmese thought that DVB was just a bunch of propagandists uh, who were lying for the opposition just as uh, the government media lied for the media. And feedback from foreign donors was unfavorable. They didn't like DBB's strident tone and the propagandistic content. And Norway was a damn cold place to be if you came from Burma. Okay? What was to be done about the state of affairs? Well, they decided that they must achieve, the journalists decided they must achieve editorial independence of the opposition. And they set about what was quite a long battle to win that. And they won it. People like Aung San Suu Kyi were receptive to this, but some of the other opposition parties were deeply suspicious and hostile to this notion of editorial independence. But the journalists recognized that if they were going to get any credibility at all, the word coming from Infide Burma was that they had to be patently independent. By the time the Buddhist monks led thousands of Burmese in the demonstrations that we now know as the, uh, the uh, Saffron Uprising, DVB had changed the tone of most of its broadcasting. It was succeeding in professionalizing the service it provided. It was broadcasting professional news content, not agitation, into Burma. Secondly, it had greatly increased as a result its credibility among people inside Burma and its foreign funders were a great deal happier too. DVB had also achieved, through a London agent that it had, uh, was in touch with, agent, uh, access to radio transmitters that were closer to the Burmese border, and hence the radio signal uh, into Burma was greatly improved. DVB was also now broadcasting television footage by satellite a few hours, for a few hours every day into Burma. So people inside Burma who had access to uh, themselves uh, um, satellite dishes or people, friends who had satellite dishes could listen to them. They had also, DVB, established a network of correspondents inside Burma which, which was, who were smuggling out print, audio, and video material daily, usually through uh, Thailand uh, to DVB in Oslo. And DVB also believed that in any one week, about one in five of Burma's 55 million people was listening to or watching at least one DVB program in any one week. I've spoken to some independent uh, media consultants in the area who've been involved in training and traveled around a lot, and they think that this notion of 20% penetration is absolutely credible. DVB was also, during the Saffron Uprising, selling its material that he'd got from inside the country. I understand from that, that similar thing has happened in Tibet. They were, 
they were managing to sell material that they sold, that, is, that they'd taken, of the um, footage that they'd taken of the uprising to uh, international news organizations like the BBC, Al Jazeera, big American networks, CNN, etc. And these major networks were treating their material now as credible. In other words, they attributed to DVB the status of professional news organization. In sum, DVB was succeeding in powerfully projecting its message to, to its most important audience, that's the Burmese inside the country, they're the most important audience, but also increasing sustained global political and diplomatic pressure on the Burmese dictatorship, particularly over the period of the uprising. And many of you will have seen Burma Vijay, this fantastic film, on what they did. Now I want to, in conclusion, I just want to look at a couple of things here. What were the political aims of the opposition? One was to induce the downfall of the military dictatorship in Burma through the aggressive use of nonviolent methods. Secondly, to dismantle the dictatorship and build a democratic system, probably via negotiations. How did, what, were the, what was the way in which the DVB tried to align its media objectives with this? Well, it sought to make widely available, credible, quality information and perspective to Burmese people and political actors and to the global community. Now, I don't want to make out that BVB is the only organization doing it. There's also Radio Free Asia, and there's also uh, VOA and BBC, and one or two others in the area. But this is a particular intervention by a group of opposition people in Burma. Secondly, in terms of aligned media objectives, they were seeking to provide a platform for mutual persuasion between Burmese political antagonists. DVB, and this is a crucial point, now sees its role as being to provide even-handed coverage of the antagonists in Burma. That means to the extent of phoning the military, not going to see them because they'll get arrested for being DVB reporters, but phoning the military from abroad and saying, well, there's been this or that incident down the road where Mrs. So-and-so has been beaten over the head by one of your officers. What have you got to say about it? At first, of course, the military were incredulous. I mean, who are these people? Mad! Phoning us up to find, get, a, get comment from us. <coughs> One or two um, people have responded to DVB's uh, uh, inquiries and, I'm afraid, been fired by the military uh, dictatorship for their, for their trouble. But DVB insists on at least seeking the dictatorship's response to news events inside Burma. And this is part of trying to, as I say, make available credible quality information and perspectives to Burmese people across these, these, these gulfs of antagonism that there are in the society. And to provide, and this is derived from the conversation that I had with the leadership in Oslo, to provide a platform for mutual persuasion uh, between the Burmese political antagonists. So in other words, if, you, if you can in, you're trying to draw both sides in your reporting and in the responses to incidents on which you're reporting into a debate or an exchange of views, okay? Now, and wherever possible, as I say, to provide even-handed coverage of them. What they're trying to do, they say also, is to prefigure the basis for a future public service broadcasting system and culture in Burma. By a public service broadcasting system, we're talking about something like the BBC in the, U in the UK. Now, how credible is this Burby strategy? It's something I'm trying to deal with academically at the moment. But what, the Burm what, the, what DVB is saying is we can, through our media coverage, actually help bring about this democratic outcome that we seek, not by engaging in hostile propaganda against the military regime, but rather by engaging in even-handed coverage of the antagonism. Are they crazy? Well, I think there's a very sound argument based on a little bit of theory that they're not crazy at all. Um, there's been some recent work on what's called the act of persuasion. Okay? How I might persuade you or you might persuade me of something. And let's assume now for a moment that you, Ayushman there, from Cardiff University is a leader of the Burmese dictatorship and I'm an ex overexcitable Burmese intellectual and the left and the opposition and we're having a go at each other over the radio station and uh, he says, well, 
I'm not bloody well giving up my, you know, my job and my security and my this and my that and my privileges and whatever. Or I recognize in what he's saying that if I push him to the limits, his ultimate conviction, or in terms of in the theoretical terms that I've been dealing with, what are termed his commitments, the things to which he's ultimately committed, are things that I might be able to deal with. And from his point of view, he looks at me and I'm saying, well, I want democracy. I want one person, one vote, and I want an ongoing system of free, the free media, etc., 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 and a whole a range of, of freedoms. And he recognizes what my commitments are, what my ultimate positions are, the positions I'm not going to sacrifice. If we know each other's commitments, we can reach a deal. I, and the way in which I persuade him and the way in which he persuades me is to, uh, if I want to persuade him, I argue from his commitments to my conclusion. What I'm saying is I argue to him, if you want to safeguard your security, your job, whatever, the intelligent thing for you now to do is to see the need for democracy. And you say to me, well, you want democracy. I'm in a position to stymie your desire for democracy. You want democracy. That's your commitment. Let me argue you towards my conclusion. You want democracy. You allow me to keep my privileges. Okay? It's a question of arguing from your opponent's commitments to your conclusion. I think it's an extremely plausible strategy. It is, is it, does it assume a certain level of rationality on the other person on the other side yes it does is that assumption of rationality realistic well maybe we don't know but when things become very difficult in political situations there can be movement which is not entirely rational except in the sense of self-interestedly rational and where somebody may indeed be a, a member of the dictatorship may indeed be open to being convinced or persuaded in the way that I've been discussed I've discussed so what I've tried to do is to give you two ideas of two strategies employed by two different groups of people in two countries in struggles for democracy. Thanks. Uh, when the when, when your newspaper is <coughs> done by the government, do yeah. you use your same media strategies and like alternative tactics like pamphleting? And other kind of like media. Yeah. Brands. Well, there were lots of. I mean, lots of newspapers were being banned all the time. This was a, a national. It was a big national newspaper. Um, students, in particular, um, there was a thing called SASPU, South African Students Press Union, which brought out many, 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 many um, uh, uh, sort of once-off publications about resistance and that. And then in the in the in the more establishment sort of right-wing uh, newspapers, there were people that were friends of ours who were doing a similar kind of thing, but they were not in the position that we'd been in, which, where we actually controlled a newspaper because of a sedentary editor. Okay? Um, but what, uh, at the same time, uh, actual events began to, let us say, almost overtake uh, the need to engage in the kind of conscious setting of agenda that, that, that we had gone in for in 77, 78, 79. Uh, I say that because the uh, resistance uh, uh, just grew to levels where, when, particularly after the UDF had been formed, in, the United Democratic Front was formed in 1983, resistance grew to levels that were, you know, I mean, you'd, you'd, have to, you'd have to be the man in the moon to have ignored them as a, as a journalist or a newspaper. So um, events, let's say, pushed themselves into the news uh, eventually. DVB yeah. strategy yeah. that you identified, is that, um, is that a strategy that, that they have Consciously, um, yeah. Adopted, I mean, or well, is this something that you? Well, no. The the, the the bit the bit at the end where I say, "Is this a plausible strategy?" Okay, uh, that's me. That's that, that's me trying to test, uh, and I'm using a thing called argumentation theory, a, a set of ideas developed by an Amer at least a Canadian chap called uh, Walton and some Dutch philosophers. But it's not um, up to the point of my saying. You know, I'm trying to test it. That is. Um, I'm reading some things into their strategy, but it's, it's, uh, the, the, the commitment to developing a, an even-handed approach, that's I have on record from the two most senior people in, in DVB, the, the, their desire to form a public service broadcaster with a public service ethos, 
i.e. where they're trying to, that is the, where they're trying to develop a kind of deliberative approach to the news and to democratic construction. Mm -hmm. That also comes from these two chaps uh, at the top of DVB. Um, so I'm not overstating their, their thing. When I go into my own language is when I'm talking about testing it through this argumentation theory and this business of commitments and uh, arguing from another person's commitments to your conclusion. Yeah. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> um, question to you on a couple of comments on the slide. So, uh, you know, in the beginning you mentioned about how media could sort of like a change, you know, the, the story that or interview that you try to, you know, mm -hmm. try to convey. Um, I just like to you know what you think of my so sort of like own strategies. I, you know, explain the same thing. Sometimes you provide an interview and then if you get all the information and then you're so committed and you know what's going on, what needs to be done, and then next thing you know, like totally different story came out. So over time, I so that like, you start to notice it because they are serving a different targeted audience. They have different purposes, they have different reasons. So, and I started to so sort of like you, you know, change a little bit or modify a little bit in terms of what sort of information at that particular media will be interested mm -hmm. by so by doing my own little bit of research about okay who are you gonna be and they contact me about, okay I want to interview you and blah blah blah. And I ask them okay what who are the audience and what kind of things are they interested in. And then I only sort of like provide you know relevant information on news or like you know whatever the incident that might be relevant for that to the you know, um, interview uh, newspaper or you know, TV station or anything. So along that way I could be so sort of like the diluting the the, the, the so sort of like the actual information, but at the mm -hmm. same time, so sort of like a bit more predictable in terms of you know what will be coming out of it. Yeah. So I'm not sure if that's sort of like a strategy that you. Think I think that's a. I think it's a very reasonable strategy, given if you accept that there are these constraints, you know, that that, mm -hmm. that there are going to be these um, lenses, you know, or these frames that are probably going to dominate whatever information it is that's, that's given, then I think you can strategically and selectively provide information um, in a way that, that, that maximizes the, the power, the, the efficacy, and the accuracy of what it is that, that you're conveying. Um, ideally, ideally um, you know, we eventually will, will be able to evolve these journalistic practices and norms in a way that, that you feel like your story can can actually be told accurately without having to strategize about how to select specific information and and researching this media outlet prior to providing whatever information it is you think they'll they'll, they'll be willing to use. But I think um, for the moment, I think that's that's probably. Um, that's probably a very reasonable strategy. Yeah. A couple of things. Well, yeah. I think in your slides, uh, mm -hmm. Aung San Suu Kyi won the Nobel Peace in 1992, I believe it was 1991. I'm oh, sorry, but she went to... And also, um, <laughs> I don't think she ever left Burma to meet with the DVB in the Oslo since 1988. She never left Burma on, since 1988 until now. So she, so, she, she was there, she went to pick it up in 1992. No. She did. I, I, I mean, I, unless she's lying to me. Um. <laughs> I have another very reason. Her, her husband, at the time, she, he was still alive, as well as her two sons, on behalf of her, received that Nobel Peace Prize. She never left Burma since 1980. Even her, her well, uh, husband was dying yeah. in London. Like so I'm not sure where. Well, look, I, I can. I mean, all I can do is show you. I mean, I can show you on camera her. Telling me that she was really? <laughs> yes, and and also the chap from DVB said you know we met her in in, uh, in Oslo. She was from Burma since She Well, I I'm, I'm, I'm mystified. I mean, thank you for telling me. I have to check it now and see whether I've I've some. Yeah, I'm just wondering where you got that information from. Well, from her and from really? the the two chiefs of DVB. So. Maybe she left a different way that we don't know. You are always and the Howard by the government. It's always in the house by the government. Maybe. Well, like I, I, like I, I'll, I'll, I'll check. I'll, I've got it on my computer, so I'll have a look at it. And also, uh, you should mention about the how many uh, 
GBB inside journalists arrested in the prison mm -hmm. to be at this kind of now work. So, yeah, they send them like a more than 65 or 18 years in the prison. Uh, uh, it, and I, I mean, what connection should I have done that? Um, just because it's an important fact or because it relates to what I was saying? I, di I didn't include that because I don't have space to, I mean, I'm trying to cut down to issues of strategy or tactics. But yes, that is true. I mean, uh, there's one, one young woman, I think, of 26 yeah. years old, who's got 20 years. Huh? Yeah, 20 years yeah. and a half rest. Yeah. And then also, I want to mention about the, your interview with the ABC. For me, I, mean, I am the radio journalist from the Radio Free Asia, right? I also report about suffering, suffering pollution from the Bangkok. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of contact who mm -hmm. can speak English, who can speak Burmese. So we just we can directly connect with who is a leader who lived in the suffering revolution. So you can find it in the uh, Bama BJ. So we have a directly connect from the leader. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why the ABC choose you or the uh, demo. I think uh, you, you can explain because of a lot of footage and also like a picture of them from the citizen journalist. This is the very first time we saw really happening in Burma. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really thanks to you. And then also but for ABC, they should find a real representative from the Burma. Mm -hmm. And then also they should find a real uh, source from the Burma. So it's like, you know, you mentioned like they have a second and third so that So it's might be information, maybe, you know, change or misunderstood or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think, sorry. Um, just, to, just a quick response to your comment. Um, this was a affiliate, an, an NBC affiliate that I, I was referring to, and this was in, in Rochester, New York. And so the, the, the origin of that, um, story was the fact that there was there was this person, this um, yeah. exile, Burmese exile in Rochester. Let's this was an opportunity to tell a story in a way that yeah. that connected it to the local community. Which so so they initially I think that the um, intent was um, was very well meaning, but it was the way that that the story eventually evolved. You know the way that the that it turned out that, that was problematic. Um, but also regarding what you just said about yeah. um, Radio Free Asia, I, I, I noticed that there was um, kind of a, a, a you know surreal lack of um, looking to um, like entities, other media entities like Radio Free Asia um, for um, you know as sources or, or resources on on those events as they were unfolding and. And that I don't really have a great explanation for. I think that media, you know, often tend to rely on on reporters and journalists that they've used previously or that they have some familiarity with. You know, there's some sort of credibility or relationship established, um, or there could be something, you know, even more um, concerning, you know, deep going on at a deeper level. But um, so I don't have an, an answer to that per se. But I will say that I noticed it yeah. as well. First of all, thanks for your presentations. And Howard, you're, you know, one of the takeaway points that I get when I talk to you, and you made it again in this presentation, is that resistance is a story. And I think it's a great point. And then I thought, well, what are the components of a good resistance story? And I, and I thought about Cindy's presentation, which was, uh, I thought, a very incisive critique of all the framing and misframing that goes on. And I, I sort of mentioned it while you spoke, but I'll say it more explicitly. Part of what makes a good civil resistance story is sort of the opposite of everything Cindy talked about, which you ended on with meta frames. I don't know if you could bring that up easily again. The, the six meta frames that, that never really accurately tell the story of civil resistance, the opposite of those frames are all what makes a great story of civil resistance, and just something for journalists in here to keep in mind. I, I personally, I'm kind of ashamed to say it, I like bullet point lists. And so I thought this, like the six bullet points were, or five were, were good. Yeah, and that, that's, that's essentially the point that we're right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I would say that I think um, 
in most cases, only someone that's yeah. already conscious of the phenomenon, you know, who, who's already sort of primed to look for these distortions in the coverage, or somehow has access to right. understanding the, the, the gap between the reality and the reporting, is, is going to be able to really identify these consciously, anyway, um, you know, yeah. during yeah. Right, yeah. but I'm just, yeah, for, I'm talking about for the purposes of people who might be writing yeah. you know, things to keep Absolutely. in mind when they write. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Two things. One, um, in the 60s, in the southeast part of the United States, there was probably only one paper, maybe two, who would report the stories. At that time, New York did. The uh, New York Times did a good job of reporting uh, pretty well. Lots of paper, uh, papers around the country had no idea, and though there were often AP reports, they did not. So the newspaper, as a source of the story, is probably not that good, generally speaking. Now we have a different situation. Most of those newspapers have been bought up by a single media corporation, mm -hmm. by a big corporation. Yeah. Now, it's bad enough when it was owned by a family in yeah. Greenville, Mississippi. So we now have a different situation. And invariably, the story, well, I'll say it this way. I think that we, need, we the people of the United States, are largely ignorant of much of the world and largely unaware of, about ourselves, uh, period. So it seems to me that in, in, the, in the U.S. situation, <coughs> the U.S. situation, and, and, and they haven't reported on stories. This is a good framing of what the paper reports some kind of but they reported almost none of the major stories of change in the 20th century, mm -hmm. to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. The New York Times, I started reading in 1943, and it is such a different paper today than it was in 1943. It did have a much more solid reporting, old-fashioned reporting of who, what, where, when, why. So you could get that from it almost any story in the United States or in Europe. So I guess my point is that uh, how, is there a really good alternative in at least my country to media reporting on struggle and movement apart from the mandate of Gandhi of us creating our own Hmm. What is there? Um, I, I, I don't think that there's one consistent and reliable source on the reporting of nonviolent struggle. I think that some journalists and reporters, um, you know, who may have more familiarity with with particular struggles or contexts. Um, have the ability to uh, report on those, those those struggles and those movements more comprehensively, more authentically. Um, but um, I, I I don't think there's consistency, um, across, and so there isn't one identifiable media, um, in my view. Um, I'd be curious how it is. Um, well. I I, the way I understood your story was how do you get people to report on these kinds of things? Is that, is, have I understood you correctly? You're saying that people are not reporting on the kind of stories they need to report well, on. Well, I've been engaged in a variety of yeah. movements in Los Angeles yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, over the years. And I can't think of any particular struggle where we made, where we made advances here, yeah. where the media could report the story or report it. In, in many instances. At all, or just not accurately? Not accurately, and sometimes not at all. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Josh Yeager and I, with lots of help from Mary and others, are putting out the thing which might give some ideas on how to how to. Um, uh, well, on my teaching now, yeah. as I work with different community groups, I try to push hard at stop calling press conferences, <laughs> stop relying upon reporting locally, put a communications committee together, and 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 have that committee report the stories. I mean, there are independent and, and mostly progressive um, alternative media that, that I think are, are, are reliable and pretty good, but they're but they're they're not owned by any of these major media can corporations you, can that you can name me one in since in, in California in our state. Mm -hmm. Truth out. Uh, Truth out or alternate or are you looking for but more local media? That's online. Oh, it's um, online, but in the um, public, in the public media. I would, I would do three things. No, I can't. I'd do three things. I would sit down with my organization and say, we've got to get somebody into X and Y newspapers who's going to actually look at this and report on this kind of struggle, and who's going to be in that newspaper doing other stuff for as long as he or she needs to until he or she can get himself into or herself into a position to be able to report on these things. I would actually go for that kind of approach. Now, I come from a background of politics and conspiracy, so yeah. that's, that's my, that would be my, my, my first point. But, but I'm not talking conspiracy. No, 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 but I, but I mean, I think you have to get to that. No, but I, okay, you're not talking conspiracy, but when you... When you but, but Howard, yeah. in the United States in 2003, we had all kinds of actions going on against going to war in Iraq. Establishmentarian papers, including the New York Times, steadily reported very little about that and had a consistent barrage of reporting of why we're going to war, including all these stories. Matt, the weapons of mass destruction, Hussein is such a bad guy. The historic arguments from our government, that's what the New York Times, the New York, New York Times has not yet apologized. Yes, they have. Yeah. Oh, they did? Yeah. When, did, when did this happen? About two years ago. Okay. They lied. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm saying that, that's, they that is... They didn't admit to lying. But they no, they didn't admit to lying. No, they took the... They took the well, that's a very, you said, your, your question is poignant because um, I'd be curious to know if anyone else in the room can, 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 it, can come up with one example of print media that, that does what you're asking. But I can't think of any. Well, well many of these folk come from the place. But if, the media does not basically tell the truth about their situation. I'm, I'm burning to say something here. Yeah, because I worked for four years for SNCC yeah. trying to deal no, with the I problem don't. Jim is talking about. Mm -hmm. The New York Times was not great. They had one man, Claude Sidney, yeah, yeah. that Claude, we could yeah. get our material right. to. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we were pushing out our stories through a variety of networks. Mm -hmm. One was working through groups of friends in various cities like Princeton, Boston, Eugene, San Francisco, and so forth. We would call them and get them to put pressure on the local wire services <laughs> to cover the fact that there were 18 people just arrested here or Fannie Lou Hamer's right, right. Far, house had been shot into yes. or to get a reporter yeah. to a jail. This was my job to try to get a reporter to a jail because it might be the only way of saving someone's life. Yeah. Um, that's what I did for four years. Eventually we got our own offset press so we could churn out our own newspaper and circulated through these groups all over the country called Student Voice. The problem hasn't changed, no. just the tactics. That's, that's, that's a terrific illustration of working under the duress and intimidation of the system. Well, that is organization. I mean, you worked under that, you broke through. It's the same in the media. You've got to, you get in there and you make elbow room and you, you, know, you do whatever you have to do. Well, that's, that's part of my definition of nonviolence. Yeah. That, 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 it, it creates a new power source in the community, and a power source that, 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 that then push to make things happen. And this is what Gandhi did. That's what, that's what, that's what created his own publications and spent all of his time pushing out. 
Just one thing to clarify, one thing has changed, and that's newspapers, frankly, are dying. Uh, and the sooner they die, in our view, the better. And I'll tell you why. Wait, wait, wait. wait. That's a contribution. No, wait, listen. It's a long way away. Newspapers, including the New York Times, by doing what they did, really lost the trust of their readership. Um, when we make our own media, we don't call it alternative media, and we don't for a reason. Because our wish is not to be the alternative. Our wish is to redefine what the media is. And that is happening. And I think that we are trying to, we're looking at a broad, broad process whereby we can recreate what the concept of media is. And so uh, when I say, oh, the sooner the newspapers die, the better, I'm not saying that I, that I wish for a steady and swift destruction of, of a free press, quite the opposite. I think we need to, to just change the way information is reported on, consumed, disseminated, and I think that that is happening. And that's why I don't, I don't think we should set out to, to, to think of what we do as when we create our own media as alternative media, but we're trying to create a new kind of media. Okay, and then... Well, I think the conventional media, the demise of the conventional media is like years away. But I mean, what Sue said and what Reverend Lawson said, I mean, it's an ideal situation, but we operate in a world where there's a global commercial media and where there's an impetus on speed. And every news media organization in the world is attached to wire services where they get snippets on, of information and every journalist, no matter what his beliefs are, no matter what he, you know, like understands about the movement, just has to you know, re-engineer that into a small news story. And I was working at Sky News when the Egyptian protest broke out on, on uh, National Police on the 25th of January. And my editor told me that uh, do a piece on it for the Sky News website. And I was calling people up, I was researching, I was putting the news together. But then he's like, don't waste time. You've already had one hour of writing it. Here's a press release, rewrite this one. That's what I'm paying you for, yeah. I think that's a really good point. That journalists are under so much pressure from the 24-hour news cycle that it's easier in some ways now to get things in print if you do the work for the journalists. If you do the work, it'll happen. But you, because there's a lot of laziness. That's why PR firms are so powerful these days. Cases these are Okay. Um, so we have seen a lot of problems in journalistic writing, and it's just. Uh, unfortunately, one of the unhappy realities that we have to deal with. Someone says, journalists are your enemies. And based on my experience, um, when a journalist approaches you, he has done a lot of research and has already formed a draft in his mind. So that really leaves you a dilemma. If you um, accept the interview, then it may damage your movement. If you don't accept the interview, then your, inter your, then your movement get uncovered. Okay. So my question is, do you have any um, practical advice on how to engage your enemies? For <laughs> <laughs> Turn your enemies into we, we are bringing out a media module which, which tries to deal with some of these issues um, and how to deal with the media. It, uh, I hesitate to say this, but it should be out, I would hope, by the end of October. Um, I would hope um, on the ICNC website as a free download and it will deal with some of these issues. It can only deal with so many issues, but um, it will deal with some of these issues. How to, how to meet the alien and learn to love him. <laughs> <laughs> follow that, but I would just add, um, instead of assuming that the journalist is the enemy, treat them like a potential a future ally. Yeah, well, first, yeah. Yeah. Journalist is a tool. No, but that's right. a tool, yeah. Well, this is an interesting <laughs> point, because I'm getting ready to open up an argument with a friend of some standing on this business. Uh, I do, I, I have experience the notion that I've had the experience again and again of seeing enemies turn into friends, of seeing people who were hostile uh, change over a period of time. 
but I really don't make that a major purpose of nonviolence. I make it a serendipitous purpose and a secondary purpose of nonviolence. In my judgment, it's more important for nonviolence to engender the kind of power that forces a grid change in your locality. And let then the, 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 the reconciliation work, the changing work, go on out of that work, although, yeah, do some one-on-one -on -one work, some follow-up work if you can, if it's, if, it's, if it's available there for you to do some of that. But basically my contention is that getting a little bit of change in the direction of justice hope is the major task in nonviolence, is a major power, benefit of, of nonviolence. Uh, and in my own country, that's, that's probably always an incremental approach. You can't win the whole thing in any given day. I mean, uh, someone asked me the other day, and I was pointing out that in Nashville, you know, the, the changes took just the technical changes, getting signs down and hospitality reestablished, and so so white clerks would be mad at you when you walked in the door to look for something. This that didn't happen in one year or two years anywhere that I know of. That that took in Nashville maybe ten to twenty years before it began to really turn go the other way. So you can't you can't you cannot change it overnight in my judgment. There may be some things that you can, but these systems have come in place for four centuries or five centuries. How do you how do you with any single action turn it around? Sometimes it's just with attrition. Beg your pardon? It's attrition. Yeah. Yeah. I mean you know better than Let me jump in and, and make a comment that reflects on uh, the what at ICNC we think is the advisability of looking at this from a strategic point of view, which means, I guess in its simplest form, at least as applied to this, um, evaluating the costs and benefits of any particular course of action vis-a-vis -vis the media, since you have limited time, resources, and people with which to engage any particular audience or constituency or potential ally. Um, it is true that, if, if, if it is true that the conventional media are the dinosaurs who are dying out, and an alternative or movement media are the new little furry mammals running around, <laughs> that you could decide to base your diet on you might as well, if you know how to kill, if you know how to get the dinosaurs and slice them up, you know, <laughs> run them down, slice them up, and eat them, then you should continue doing that if it is still a good use of your time, resources, and people. Uh, if it's easier to chase the furry little mammals running around, then pay attention to them, you know, or move in that direction. I can't take that analogy any further. But, <laughs> What I'm trying to get at is this. Why are we uh, supporting um, Howard Verrill and Josh Yeager's project to put together a long form, very high, very high quality video that is addressed to organizers and activists about how to put your case before the conventional media in such a way that they will find it, they will wake up and they will say, wow, this is potentially a good story. By, and, and what they do is a combination of what I would call constructive deception in the sense that they will, they know what, what triggers the media. Oh, that, oh, okay, we can cover that, okay. And so they break all that down and reassemble that in a form that is useful for you, the organizer or activist, you have a shot, at least, at getting the attention of the conventional media. Um, but what that does not do is to try to adjust 
of the criteria for doing a story that the conventional media possesses. Unless you're lucky enough to engage with particular journalists who work in the conventional media, who intellectually wake up to the idea in a larger way that a campaign or a movement is really worth covering. It was that premise that guided ICNC's media efforts for several years. And we found out that it was basically the equivalent of selling encyclopedias door to door, which I did one summer in college. Uh, and I wasn't very good at it for a lot of reasons. Uh, but, um, uh, <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. But I'm better now than I was. Anyway, uh, but the, the, the reason it's selling encyclopedias door to door is that you have a frame, you have a history to present, you have what the people are doing, you have great individual stories, you have so much potentially to offer that it is too much for these folks with professionally limited attention spans really to take on board. So what we did is we targeted a fairly senior group of particular editors with particular you know, publications, sagacious publications, and people who run rang long pieces, and big news, you know, newspapers like the Financial Times would run long, and were had people who had graduated from the Fletcher School of Long Diplomacy, you know, and at that level, you know, and they could sit still for a long argument about this. And that actually worked, and we produced two uh, central sections in The Economist in a period of, where we got The Economist to produce, we shifted the coverage of The Economists of nonviolent action and people power from, oh, look at those, you know, you know, naive, obnoxious protesters to, well, this might be a serious social and political force. But the time that it took to do that, mm -hmm. the, the year, the several years it took, and our resources, you know, and going back and meeting them, holding our hand and giving them lollipops of attention to all of that, <laughs> we just decided we couldn't do it. I mean, we limited time and resources, can't do it. And so when we met, you know, Al Giordano and his crew, and we wanted to try to invent a way to intrigue young alternative independent journalists in the idea of covering movements and campaigns, that seemed to us more cost beneficial. You might get better intelligent coverage given the way the media is changing. That still that is still not to say that I won't stay in touch with media people that I know are very interested in this or have a way to recognize it. I'll give you a specific example. Uh, uh, for various reasons I came to know going to conferences running into a guy who is the Paris bureau chief of one of America's leading three news magazines, or I guess leading two news magazines now. And he um, was a, had been all over the Middle East forever and spoke several languages and was uh, almost my age, and so he had a lot of experience behind him. And we got together and we talked, and it was quite clear that he had done such deep investigative journalism of change in the Middle East you know, had, uh, hadn't just, when he went to Palestine, he didn't just sit in the bar at the King David Hotel, he actually went out and talked to, you know, lots and lots of people. And so he sort of understood, so when I framed what we were doing, it was, he understood it. He said, well, that's really interesting. He said, I don't want to keep in touch. He said, if you know of any really good stuff, you know, let me know. I'm particularly interested in, you know, so that was a useful conversation to have. You could, you might, you should do that. But, uh, but it, and so what I, I've just given you an example from ICNC's experience in terms of what's potentially cost beneficial if you are involved on behalf of movement as an advocate uh, or as a as someone trying to do communications from inside a campaign or movement because it can be done. There are smart people who are interested in those sorts, and they want. But what is it that triggered? What is it? What triggered that particular reporter, or what triggered the Economist people? The actual substantive argument that. This is an increasing form of change in the world, and if you miss it, you, you can't really presume to do uh, effective analysis of events at the cosmic level that you're doing analysis. You've really got to understand this, and all we're trying to do is explain it. You know, that's our job is to explain, try to explain and account for all these movements and campaigns. So that's why you should take some information from us. And that line works. So we're able to adjust the intellectual perspective. We would never presume to try to adjust the professional perspective, which is what I need to do my job is one, two, three, four, five. Could never, couldn't, we're not qualified to do that. Uh, and so, so I'll go back to my original image. I mean, that's why we would, we will help support this effort because there are dinosaurs out there who are uh, you know, 
who it's important to go after. As long as they're there, as long as they're thundering across the landscape, you know, then it's useful to try to go after them because suddenly the Arab Spring and all this has happened and nobody, know, they have no idea. They were all, as Peter said this morning, they were all stunned and surprised. How could this have happened, you know, uh, in the country that I've been studying and reporting on for the last 30 years? Uh, and, uh, but by the same token, it's also important to follow the lead that Greg just framed, which is to say, particularly if you're inside a movement, uh, but even if you're in an NGO and you want to get more attention to the cause of rights in a particular country, or in a particular group of people maybe who live in a number of different countries, then it's equally important to try to think about ways to cre create one's own media or to ally or partner with independent journalists uh, who, who have the journalistic skills but are looking for juicy stories that also that are going to sort of um, be really noticeable on the curve of public interest. Mm -hmm. We should have mercy on it. Yeah, we should. Uh...